Mr. Beck. So tonight I'd like to start with our Grinspoon nominee. I'm not sure if there's a faculty yeah. member able to make it. Um, I had the confluence of uh, having Mr. Burns do a presentation, but he is the Hopkins recipient of the Grinspoon Award for Excellence in Teaching. He has been the chair of the Social Studies Department formally for the last couple of years, um, informally, perhaps a bit before that. Um, has made an exceptional effort in collaboration with the English Department at Hopkins Academy and um, full integration of the Common Core through the humanities in grades 7 through 12. Uh, he frequently extends learning beyond the classroom with multiple well-designed field trips that have often inspired students to pursue a variety of careers and make deep connections to their current learning. He created courses such as AP Modern European History as well as, well as cultivating from the expertise in, expertise in his department courses in mythology, philosophy, political science, government, and art history. Across the school, he took over the school council. Um, I don't mean hostile takeover, I mean. <laughs> student council. Student council, my bad. And he's here you, helpfully correcting. I was gonna say you didn't know, but no, he brought just right gave in. you a new job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and through the course of this year, built the, the, rebuilt the constitution of the student council by holding a constitutional convention. Mm -hmm. I have had a student council constitution on my desk for five months. Has it been that long? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that needs to be completely ratified by me. Um, he implemented in the fall a Veterans Day ceremony, uh, moving away from the September 11th ceremony, which was something that was huge in the community and provided us uh, an opportunity really to bring the whole school together and remember something that was very important. Um, Mr. Burns and many of the students, including members of the band who felt it was very challenging to uh, be prepared for as early as September 11th to do something in terms of a public presentation, uh, changed the ceremony to a Veterans Day ceremony, which broadened the, the um, group of people who were honored and recognized and went one step further by having his students reach out uh, to the American Legion and local veterans and bringing veterans in to speak in front of our students about their experiences um, was incredibly powerful this year. He also initiated the master's schedule research endeavor, uh, which took place over the course of the last three semesters, um, and did an enormous amount of work with his colleagues, with me, with numbers, and all sorts of other uh, research and compiling that for the staff. Um, I can only imagine how much time it must have taken him to do it. When the article came out in the newspaper, Mr. Burns took the lead in his politics class in particular, but in many other areas of the school, uh, to lead formal and informal conversations between students about race, gender, equity, uh, and other issues that were of concern, and really did a fantastic job of facilitating a really powerful student conversation. And I think probably one of the most important things outside of the outside community service that he does in Greenfield, having um, been a member of the Relay for Life and uh, is a member of the National Organization for the Prevention of Suicide, is over the last three semesters, I've received more than a dozen emails uh, and phone calls from parents um, thanking Mr. Burns for the time that they've spent, that he has spent in particular, um, providing some emotional support to young men. In, in many ways, um, we as boys, not only do we not pull over and ask for directions at the local gas station, but uh, we often don't necessarily feel comfortable bringing you know, uh, challenges forward and, and to be able to discuss them in a way that will be productive for us. And, and Mr. Burns has provided a safe environment for that and uh, helped many, many students through the years and is well deserving of this award. So congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, for the school, the school report has as one part of it, um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has proactively moved their dates because of all the snow cover really across the Commonwealth, anticipating that baseball, softball fields, uh, track and field facilities won't be up and running and ready to go, uh, in particular out in Western Mass through mud season. Um, so they've moved the date for the tournament cutoff. Play has to be completed by May 31st rather than May 25th. So they moved everything back by one week, which is really helpful to both teams and athletic directors. Um, 
and then moved the seating meeting for the following day. It was May 26th to June 1st. They also put out in their publication that the on June 6th, the SAT and subject tests are being held, and on June 13th, the ACTs are being held. And they put that information out, assuming that pushing off the cutoff dates is also going to potentially have them scheduling tournament games on those Saturdays. And so hopefully that will provide families the opportunity to, you know, hopefully be able to take the tests a little bit earlier. When? When, when, when can they take it earlier? Then, uh, they'd have to. They'd have to check the schedules. So they'd either have to take them earlier or into their, into the fall of their senior year, depending on when those dates are. For the May deadline for us. Are there? Yep. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to congratulate the girls' basketball team. Obviously, uh, mm -hmm. making it to the cage th for two years in a row is quite an accomplishment. They took us on a great ride this year. Congratulations also to Kate and Mackenzie Sullivan, who both, both of whom finished with 1,000 points, and the boys' basketball team for their District 4, uh, I'm sorry, their Western Mass District 4 division, uh, district title, um, and for taking us all to the next level, to WPI, to once again face a Sutton team. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, what, what they've done over the last several years uh, athletically in the school, both boys and girls, has been remarkable. The number of banners that these young people have added to our walls is pretty incredible. Um, also, congratulations to Juliet Cook of the Hopkins Academy equestrian team, who qualified for the next level of competition as a result of her third place finish in the New England competition, and I believe her zones competition comes up this weekend on March 28th. So best of luck to Juliet. And also, we're very proud of uh, seventh grader Thea Hanscom, who will join the boys' uh, baseball program here at Hopkins. Uh, as far as we know, Thea will be the first female baseball player at Hopkins Academy. So congratulations to Thea for uh, putting herself out there. We're very proud of her and looking forward to watching her play. Um, on Thursday, March 12th, Hopkins Academy um, hosted 35 students and two teachers from a suburb of Tokyo in Japan. The students were between ages 15 and 17. Uh, and we did it very similar to the way that we have school choice students shadow, except there was a significant language barrier in this case. And the feedback that we got from students throughout the day afterwards and days to follow was that this was a very powerful experience for them. Um, they had an opportunity really to see uh, to be able to ask questions, and many of the questions were, you know, the, they, f they found that they were thinking the same things as students in Japan. They were curious about relationships and dating and what colleges they're looking at, what courses they're taking, and, you know, what they're planning to do with their careers. So it was really neat for the students to see that the questions that were being asked across cultures were of the same interest, despite the fact that they're literally halfway around the world. Um, the sophomore class hosts its semi-formal on March 28th, this Saturday, from 7 to 9.30. Uh, it's going to be held at Hopkins because a conflict emerged with the original venue. The middle school science fair will be held at Hopkins on April 15th, and I believe a couple school committee members uh, participate in that from time to time. The active bystander training, the 23 um, sophomores and juniors who were trained in the fall, um, met throughout the winter and have implemented the first two of six units in grades seven and eight on active bystanding and still have four more units to go in through the remainder of the year to get all the students in the middle school. Uh, the Hopkins Academy Drama Club had three successful performances between the end of February and the beginning of March, netting more than 1,500 in ticket sales and seeing many students who hadn't done performance art before joining the club and uh, they're hoping right now the more than tentative plan although it was difficult to pull together last year and the kids are excited about it but stressed out for the first time in a long time hoping to put together a musical uh, for the spring uh, to be run in the third weekend of May. Gotcha. Yep, I think so too. I think so too. Uh, but they're very enthusiastic and tryouts take place I believe begin beginning tomorrow after school. Um, the Diversity Club will be helping to collaborate with the Helping Hearts Race, and I wanted to say thank you to Nancy Craker Yaman, uh, who's a member of our school council, um, and, and has also helped us out with uh, the Diversity Club to be able to uh, coordinate with uh, Stacy Mashensky, who coordinates the Helping Hearts Race, um, in order for the Diversity Club to provide some representation and, and uh, some educational materials about diversity in Hadley and diversity across the world. Um, and April Camuso took a group of students to the Emily Dickinson Museum, uh, 
just the other day, so a local field trip that didn't require students missing any classes. And unfortunately, Mr. Burns' field trip uh, moved from Monday to moved from today to Wednesday. Uh, will not be going to New York City this year uh, due to the fact that they didn't have a minimum number of students uh, to be able to go. So. And Mr. Beck, if I may, before you move on, just to comment on the drama club. If there's any chance that our students, we are, we are not live tonight, but if at some point our students are watching this, that's probably a, a far-fetched aspiration. But I would like to say <laughs> to the students in drama, and I tried to speak to each one of them who participated in that performance, they did a remarkable job. It's a part of our school culture that doesn't always get the same level of support from, from just folks in general. It certainly doesn't make the same degree of headlines or necessarily get the same level of interest as perhaps some other extracurricular activities. And I really want to say that those students did a remarkable job. They demonstrated some acting skills that just surprised me. So I, I want to compliment them again publicly on the great work that they did. And I'm happy that they're excited about doing more of that because I absolutely think the performing arts has a place at Hopkins and I support the work that they do. Um, if I could, I wanted to, I provided a handout um, that's different than the initial handout that I gave you. This is, these are just courses that are being added to the program of studies. And you'll notice on, on the initial handout, there was a course in British literature. Um, that course was already in the program of studies. It just did not run this year. And so it was my mistake in putting it in. And then Mr. Burns and I worked on the schedule proposal, and I never consulted with him about, um, again, since the fall, adding advanced placement psychology and social studies. Uh, advanced Placement U.S. History in Social Studies, and also adding a course in Entrepreneurship. In the English Department, we're looking to add a course, course in Ethnic American Literature, which would be a college prep elective for grades 11 and 12, which along with the Advanced Placement course will give us five electives. It is likely that we will run three of those, as we did this year, um, and we'll let the course registration process serve as a survey for that, and then for those students who might drop out of um, their first choice or might not get their first choice, uh, Angie Cullinan will meet with them individually to let them know which, which will run and, and we'll integrate them back into the schedule that way. And then there are two courses in mathematics that we wanted to be able to integrate into the program of studies. Um, Pre-college algebra, uh, one is a, a fairly high level course in calculus but uh, not being run at the honors or advanced placement level but a course that provides a bridge between um, pre-calculus and uh, advanced placement or the first year of college calculus to provide students um, a stronger connection between the trigonometry, the concept of limits and moving into differentiation and integration at the most basic levels as opposed to um, having the only option be in between. And again, we'll look at the registration process to decide which courses would run. The pre-college algebra course is built off of um, the model in the Common Core in Massachusetts for Integrated Math 3, which is a post-Algebra 2 course to have students be able to um, be better prepared for post-secondary study. And so again, another course that uh, it's at the lower end of the spectrum from AP Calculus, um, but provides us another potential option uh, to be able to meet our math needs. And that's it for, for new courses. I could have really used that calculus course before my freshman year in college. <laughs> the proposed additions to the program of studies do actually require school committee approval. Mm -hmm. um, so. If I could, I, there is yeah. one more thing that I would like to add. There, there are changes to course descriptions which may or may not come later down the road this year for next year. And basically the reason is this. There are some curricular decisions. I'll use science as an example. Um, our science department is um, very well prepared, in fact, budgeted also for uh, a movement into the national science standards. So we're, we're ahead of the curve in terms of having the capacity to be able to adopt those standards. Um, Dr. McKenzie and Kathy Nigella have arranged for a gentleman at the Department of Education 
uh, who's educated in, in the national science standards to come out to work with us on April 14th and we're actually going to be doing a vertical science day with um, Hadley Elementary School teachers that, with the Department of Education present. So one of the things that we will find out is um, when the testing is uh, going to reflect the standards because what we don't want to do is you know shift our curriculum and then have the tests the standardized tests in Massachusetts still um, reflect what was the prior curriculum framework. So we just want to get a sense of what the right point of integration is. If the right point of integration for us is next year, it might be incremental. For example, we might just bring along seventh grade next year, which means I'd be bringing you a different course description a little bit later on in the school year. What's the deal with Park, with the new administration? Is it still, yeah. is that right? So who knows? Um, as Heather, Heather was, uh, Heather was kind enough to send around to the school committee an article that demonstrated or indicated the percentage of school districts that were going to park and those that were using MCAS. It's about a 50-50 split along among the Commonwealth or across school districts. My understanding uh, from the most recent meeting of superintendents is that the jury is really still out on park. So our new chair of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, is, and our new governor have both said that they are going to be very thoughtful. They, it is not a foregone conclusion that we, we would make a switch, that the Commonwealth would make a switch to park. Um, it is agreed that no matter what, that even MCAS would require, would need to be updated to be better aligned to the Common Core Standards or the Massachusetts Common Core Standards, so that would be required. There would be changes to our assessments regardless, but whether or not the Commonwealth is going to adopt PARC, that okay. remains to be seen. I'll make a motion to accept the proposed additions to the Hopkins Academy High School Program of Studies for 2015-2016 school year. I'll second that. All right, any other comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Yep, and the last piece is the probably the largest piece and will generate the most questions. I tried to prepare a packet for you that was uh, comprehensive in terms of the research um, really began with a prompting from uh, Donna Moyer as I entered as principal to do an examination of the schedule. And it was her hope that last year that we might come out with a proposal. <laughs> what we realized was um, as we got into that process, um, that we had, we, there were some things that we liked about our existing schedule. There were some things that we didn't like. Uh, there were some things that um, we needed to find out about what students liked and, and parents liked and what worked out at the, um, for college course admission and so forth. And, and we also decided to take a look at a variety of schedules rather than simply looking at you know a basic set of options. There were some parameters. One, we, we obviously had to work with an existing staffing. Two, we also have the parameter of shared staff with uh, Mr. Skelly from the elementary school. Um, and that those two pieces, you know, provide a context for us. So that limited some of the options. In, in terms of the most common options that are out there, um, what I provided in terms of research here around the process is um, something that I professionally adopted and it basically centers around having very high consensus for making a change. And the primary reason for having high consensus around making a change is that this research indicates to us that there's no perfect schedule. The schedule needs to be used as a tool in education and in order for that to be most effectively used as a tool, the faculty needs to be on board. Um, so we focused on trying to come up with something that uh, by January that would fit really well with us. Unfortunately, in January, we still only had 64% consensus. And as I mentioned at uh, the school committee meeting at the end of January, we did not at that time have anything to bring forward. Uh, Janet Slocum had presented something new um, in January that we were vetting, uh, but we were not to pre prepared to bring it forth. Um, and we just sort of finished our deliberations the day of the February school committee, which is why we're bringing a, a completed proposal together now with 80%, uh, 79.4% consensus. Um, the work that Mr. Burns and uh, the rest of the faculty focused on looking, we, you know, we cut out the four by four block schedule primarily because tested subjects 
Um, we didn't want to take a step backwards in terms of having our standardized tested subjects not be taught all year long in the high school, despite the fact that that would have mitigated a great deal of the stress on both students and teachers. It was not a viable option educationally, and nor did it add time on learning. When we came out in, in through the first part of the process and going through, we stuck by some goals and we saw some other opportunities that had emerged. Basically, the goals focused on uh, mitigating the stress on students by reducing course load, reducing the number of students assigned to each teacher, um, make sure we're maintaining our programs, in particular our fine arts and our music programs, we're not going to be put in jeopardy, uh, increase time on learning if possible in both the high school and middle school classes, um, and ho that hopefully that increased time would provide us an opportunity to do something meaningful in terms of having a mitigating impact on the amount of independent work that students have outside of school. We also wanted to be able to maintain our elective options, a work-study program, and continue to expand our dual enrollment. Uh, options that, uh, in the steps that we've taken over the last couple of years. Um, we also, if possible, wanted to be able to rotate the schedule to take advantage of the time of day and learning research um, and main, maintain some opportunity for longer periods in the schedule, uh, in particular for science courses, but all of the teachers in the building have operated in some type of a longer schedule and have a really strong skill set in terms of providing students with activities to be able to collaborate and, and do hands-on things in the context of the curriculum. This particular proposal that we arrived at, um, you see, I think on page five, is uh, a schedule in which students, all students in the school carry seven courses. So for the middle school, there's no change to the middle school student program at all other than shifting some things in terms of the time of day uh, that students would take it. And there's no change for, should be no change for middle school teachers at all in terms of um, what they take on with their students. We, we will still have a commitment to the middle school team time uh, and keeping both seventh and eighth grade teams in place with common planning time. Um, so that's something that we were able to maintain in the schedule. Um, students today, high school students, students in nine through 12, in the current schedule drop three of their long classes each day. In the new schedule, they will drop two each day rather than three. Part of the feedback that we got from students before Ms. Slocum made her adjustment, um, the overwhelming majority of students in the 24 student session held by Mr. Burns and Dr. McKenzie indicated that it was going to be stressful for them to carry six courses in one day. And so the idea of dropping two rather than one seemed like not only an interesting compromise, but also provided every teacher with more of the extended learning periods. Um, student feedback that we got, uh, in particular for some of those who sat in the meeting, said this is a little bit more manageable. You know, it's still, it's not our current schedule, it'll take some getting used to. In looking at um, the benefits of this particular <coughs> schedule, that there's no change in time on learning for the middle school. So we weren't able to make a gain there. We, there's a gain of approximately 91 minutes, which really statistically is, is no change in time on learning. However, the change in the middle school is significant. For, I'm sorry, for the high school is significant. That each of the high school courses will gain nearly 25 hours of instructional time over the course of the year from the current schedule, which really staggers and mimics a four by four semester block in terms of its time on learning. So that extension of time on learning is what we would focus on at the high school level in through the remainder of this school year and into the beginning of next year um, to hopefully make some adaptations to what we do with our curriculum so that, again, we can begin by mitigating summer homework, uh, finding something different to do with that uh, so that students <coughs> can both have an opportunity to continue learning through the summer but, you know, still have their summer, um, as well as reducing uh, independent workloads in through the courses during the school year. Um, it enables us to take advantage of the time of day in learning. There are two locked periods, whereas the se other seven periods rotate around, um, with two being dropped each day. Those 50-minute uh, periods add on um, about 900 minutes during the course of the school year to the current 45-minute periods that we have. Um, the long block schedule, sorry, the long block classes are maintained for science courses. In high school, physical <coughs> education can be run in semesters rather than the whole year, so students won't have to worry about getting changed every day, which is another management thing that we can take off of their plate. Um, 
middle school will, as of right now in our configurations, we're still looking at middle school alternating physical education classes with in seventh grade the study skills curriculum and in eighth grade with eighth grade health. It also maintains our elective options as well as um, the work study and internship options um, as well as dual enrollment options. Prior to last year, there were um, any, there were very few students who did dual enrollment, and even now there are only four at the high school who did, uh, who have participated in dual enrollment this year. Um, the overwhelming majority of students over the last five years who have participated in dual enrollment have all been off campus full time. In other words, they've been on the campus at the community college uh, as a full time student. This year we have uh, two students who are full time students and two students who are taking one course uh, in each semester. So those partial students. This schedule is a little bit different than the current schedule in that the current schedule has two courses locked in the 45 minute blocks at the end of the day. Despite that, there are some students who take those courses in the morning um, and they miss a little bit of class time. So we have to be able to account in the staggered schedule right now over the course of 12 weeks for students who would have to make up a little bit of class time if they miss it, if they miss something, that doesn't necessarily change in this schedule. The way that we look at it, the way that I look at it, is there are opportunities opportunities to be able to stabilize that student schedule, which might reduce the number of courses, uh, the amount of class time that they would miss here at the school because Tuesday is the same Tuesday schedule in the new schedule, <coughs> whereas in the current schedule, Monday and Tuesday alternate every week because it's a it's a two day rotation. Um, whereas the, so no matter what, there's going to be some time that's going to be missed off campus for students uh, who are partially enrolled. So last year with the first group of students, I think we had four students last year who were partially enrolled in order to fit them into the specific course that we had uh, carved out for them with GCC. We had, to, we had to actually shift their schedule around during the day and on the alternating day over the course of the 12 weeks of the course, they actually missed um, one and a half classes per day to be able to make that schedule work. This year, that was mitigated in our current schedule, so we'd have to do the same work with students in the new schedule working day to day. One of the implications is um, for students over the last two years, there are three students who have had work study, op uh, work study or internship opportunities that they have taken from those stable periods at the end of the day into employment later on in the afternoon. So our stable periods are now longer by 10 minutes, but they're moved to the middle, middle of the day, whereas the last block is a rotating day. So while internship and work study options can still be integrated, uh, it's not as easy for a student to, you know, they can't on a day-to-day -day basis count on being able to go from their work study directly to employment after school. So over the last three years, um, that's affected three seniors of 80. And so, you know, almost, uh, a, you know, a, a small percentage of the class, but nonetheless an opportunity that we want to try to be uh, attentive to. In our current schedule, because it alternates the internship opportunities that exist, um, would still have to be done with, you um, organizations in the community who have a degree of flexibility that they can provide to our kids because our current schedule rotates and so it's not stable that they can have a student there every day unless they're in a locked-in period. So we do still have two locked-in periods that students could do internships in. Um, I think one of the major yeah. implications for the schedule, I'm sorry. No, it, just, it, is, it is complicated. It, it, yeah. it is more complicated for them to do those kinds of opportunities. But I'm pleased to hear that you're still willing to work with them and allow them to have the opportunity. Yeah, I think we're we, not we're not we're not keeping them from exploring those opportunities when they're. Seen. No, I think it requires a level of creativity on our part. And as we looked, like I said, as we looked at the schedule in terms of dual enrollment, one of the things that we might encourage students to do would be to say, "Hey, take the one day, three hour course on Tuesday." Right. If you're going to be partially enrolled, again, most of the students who are dual enrolled are full time. We just started partial enrollment for the first time last year. And we don't want to lose that. Um, that that provides us an opportunity to get students, you know, another opportunity to get students college coursework while they're in high school. So we definitely don't want to lose that. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the major uh, things that we will need to work on for students in grades seven through twelve, and it will provide us the opportunities, the faculty, to come together on the concept of teaching study skills, is we have to help students to be able to make the same adaptation that we would have to make as a faculty to this newly rotating schedule, that they'll be dropping two courses and they're going to have to pick up 
you know, their independent assignments on a different slate. Mm -hmm. It's stable Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So the good thing is if we have a snow day, we know what we're coming back to and, and so forth. So kids can plan around that, which is very similar to what we have now. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the major implications is that there's a reduction in possible credit earning opportunities. In our current schedule, high school students take eight courses per year and this will reduce their course load to seven, which means they have a possibility of earning 40 credits in the current schedule. In the proposed schedule, they would only have an opportunity to earn 35 credits. Uh, as a result of that, on the uh, page just after the schedule is the proposed graduation requirements, which is what would really require a vote of the school committee in order for us to move forward with implementation. Mm -hmm. We examined uh, that there, there's currently a six course cushion, so to speak, for students who might uh, come across failures, which in block schedules or alternating blocks in every school, those cushions are high. This is a high cushion. Many schools that have six course schedules or seven course schedules typically have somewhere between two and four. So this would move us into that range without having to actually make a change to our graduation requirements as they stand in content areas. So what you see here in terms of the total number of credits in math, English, social studies, science, physical education, all of those specific course requirements do not need to change at all. So those remain the same. The only thing that would need to change are the incremental changes that are highlighted below that for the 2015-2016 school year, that in, for example, in order for the incoming ninth grade at the end of next year to be considered to be 10th graders, they will have to pass six out of their seven high school courses. And prior to that, they had to pass six and a half out of eight. And so the, the shift is appropriately incremental in terms of their credit earning opportunities and that cushion's consistent with what they would need to be able to graduate. Um, there are no changes for the class of 2016. We would keep that total at 130 because they would we did the research through the students and uh, there are no students substantially at risk for not graduating on time even with that change. Um, but even if there were a single student, we would have to work with that individual student and not have that uh, change. But we don't need to make that change for next year. So what that gives us the opportunity to do without substantially shifting graduation requirements is for us as a faculty to work with students and families to be able to evaluate the schedule in through next year. And if we wanted to go back for some reason, we've made a shift. Uh, or we've not made a substantial shift away from our total graduation requirements. Um, for the 2016-2017 school year, that the total number to graduate in each class incrementally would be required to earn a minimum of 30 credits. Um, but the graduates for the class of 2017 would need 125 credits and then every class thereafter would need 120 out of a possible 140 credits. So that gives them a one course cushion if there were course failures and a need to make something up for each school year. Questions? Probably. <laughs> Is there any concerns that you have in um, decreasing the total credits required for graduation from 130 to 120? I'm hearing that there's less opportunity to achieve those credits. I'm just wondering about, I guess, the perception. It, you know. I, I don't, um, in what I've heard, if I go back to one of the goals <clears throat> or one of the criteria that's in the research, that you do want to be responsive to the community. And so looking at a, this as a tool, one of the things that the community looked for and one of the things that um, you know, several years ago when the block, the alternating block was created and integrated was that they wanted to be able to expand elective options for students. So this doesn't take away from elective options. Um, what it does is it takes away that additional stressor of taking, carrying an additional course. Um, also takes that for teachers into a, a different area where they have fewer students that they need to account for during the course of the school year and therefore can work more closely individually with students and get their work back to them a little bit faster. Um, so in terms of that cushion, no, I, I don't have any concerns about that. Um, for our students who it is over the last five years of research that I've done of graduating classes, there have been, um, I don't want to give the number because it's so small that uh, it might reveal 
you know, or, or indicate a, a student who's substantially at risk. There's such a small number of students who are substantially at risk for not graduating with the six course cushion that we really need to intervene with them more quickly and we should have indicators earlier on that allow us to be able to get something in place for those students to not fall that far behind. Um, one other question. You also noted that one of the implications is the class size would go up from 14.5 to 18.5. Mm -hmm. Any concerns from the faculty from that perception or is that just a side? We point? talked about it. I think I don't want to put anybody on the spot. I think we have a couple members of the faculty here, but one of the um, we talked about that as being a reality that you know we have compared to many high schools, very small class size, and this is gonna push us up more into that average range of class size. Um, the faculty still looked at the overall student load and the opportunity to reduce another course option for students as well as the extension in the high school periods of time on learning um, as being factors that they felt like they could live with having four to six, eight more kids in some of their classrooms. Certainly taking a class from 14 to 22 or 23 um, is not something that's educationally unsound. Can you talk about how you're gonna prepare the kids for the change this year and how you're going to assess it, the success next year? Well, we've kicked around some ideas with some students. These are actually some student-generated ideas, so I don't want to think that they came, I don't want anybody to think that they came from me or anybody else, but <clears throat> the idea of if we could take, you know, some students had, had recommended that we do a mock schedule, a mock week, which is a, certainly a possibility that we could look at doing in June, um, and that would give us an opportunity to get a sense of uh, what the schedule would be like for kids in grades um, seven through 11 heading into next year and give them something to prompt, uh, give, allow them to be able to think a little bit differently. Um, but what we really have to, what we really want, what I really wanted to be able to do was to be able to work with them on what's your homework load like? And then to be able to pro provide information back to our faculty in through the course of this year in their current course load to be able to advise the faculty on which types of assignments which are currently relied on, in particular in the honors and advanced placement courses. Um, in many schools who run advanced placement courses with block schedules, they, they, it's more common that they dedicate a full year of that block. So we have half the time of most schools. So being able to add on 25 hours per course, or almost 25 hours per course, should allow us to relinquish some of that dependence on that independent workload for students, in, in particular in advanced placement and honor courses, honors courses. Um, and so being able to work with students to advise teachers on how this might look a little bit different next year and be able to hear some feedback from them on, okay, here is where the challenges are gonna be. Um, that will also help us to be able to shuffle the schedule for students and try to organize student schedules in each grade in a way that's gonna make sense for them uh, as to the extent that we possibly can. There are some opportunities that sit there instead of just throwing the schedule out there and say, oh, it's just the same, except we're gonna move the periods around and, and you have to pass a few less courses to graduate. Um, it's not quite that simple. It's a huge opportunity for us to work with kids around uh, their executive functioning and what we require of them and have those two things come together in a way that's hopefully a little bit less stressful and still really, really rigorous, so. We ready? I have no other question. It's a big motion. <laughs> change the graduation requirements? Yeah. And that is our motion, right? Yeah. Okay. So moved. Okay. Seconded. Any just further discussion? I don't think so. All in favor? Very thorough, thank you. Aye. Aye. Thanks for all the work. That was yeah. a huge effort. Mm -hmm. I think it sounds really great. We got an award in part because of it. <laughs> Are you done, Mr. Beck? Yeah, I think that was, that was, that was, that was, there's nothing on the next page, correct?